Good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Parsons, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar titled Improving Reproductive Performance of Ewe Lambs Bred at Eight Months of Age. Dr. Paul Kenyon will be our speaker this evening. He comes to us from uh, Massey University in New Zealand, and I'll say a few more words introducing him further here in a moment. Uh, but I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association providing, for providing funding support uh, for these webinar programs and encourage you to visit uh, the website of ASI and learn more about the American sheep industry and access a large volume of services and resources available to help you be successful in the sheep business. The URL for the ASI website is www.sheepusa.org. You can access the Let's Grow material specifically by uh, clicking on the Rebuild link under Programs on the main menu. You can also access it directly by using the URL www.growourflock.org. I'd like to remind our listeners that uh, this webinar is being recorded. All people who registered for the webinar will uh, receive a follow-up email. Uh, usually within the next 24 hours uh, that will have a direct link to the webinar recording as well as a link to access the slides that you see here this evening. Uh, these materials are also posted on the Let's Grow website. So if you go on there and look under programs, you'll see a uh, listing for uh, this webinar when those uh, slides are posted and uh, recording is posted. But you also see a listing of all of our past webinars. And I believe this is our, our 19th in the series. So there's quite a bit of material there for you to draw from. We're slated to go for about 45 minutes of actual presentation time, uh, which should leave us a good 20, 25 minutes at the end for uh, question and answers. Uh, feel free to uh, submit your questions at any time during the presentation by typing into the uh, question box in the uh, lower right-hand corner of your panel. And uh, you can also, uh, when the question and answer session starts, you can also do uh, questions by simply uh, raising your hand. And I'll go through that a little bit more uh, clearly when we get to that part of the program. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Kenyon. Um, he grew up on a sheep and beef farm in New Zealand before uh, heading off to college um, and earning degrees in agriculture sciences and animal sciences. And uh, of course, eventually earning his PhD in animal science. And he's currently the head of the Institute of Veterinary Animal and Biomedical Sciences at Massey University, where he also holds the title of Professor of Sheep Husbandry. Um, and you see the logo up in the upper left corner of the slide here that the uh, sheep research group there is called the International Sheep Research Center. And as a part of that program, he's been involved in a number of different uh, uh, projects over the years, including maximizing new lamb breeding performance and uh, twin and triplet lamb survival and growth to weaning. Uh, a lot of productivity issues that uh, all of us are really interested in. His research projects uh, look at both the biological science, but also the farm systems and applied level. Um, so it's very applicable for our audience here this evening. So uh, very happy to have Dr. Kenyon with us here this evening. And I'll, with that, I'll, I'll be quiet and turn the floor over to him for his presentation. And uh, welcome, Dr. Kenyon. Thank you, Jay. Um, actually, very excited about giving this webinar. I haven't done this previously, so I myself am very interested about the process. Um, just a bit of a background about the International Sheep Research Centre. Um, we're fortunate here at the university and because of New Zealand's historical interest in sheep production that we have a relatively large group still. And probably in the pasture-based sheep production in the world, we're probably not the largest group left. Um, probably got over 20 researchers plus associated uh, technicians and postgraduate students and we teach in both into the agriculture, animal science and the, and the veterinary programs. We call ourselves the International Sheep Research Centre because we have partnerships with other research like-minded groups in South America, Australia and parts of Asia and we're always welcoming uh, further collaborations. So that's basically a, about our group and as Jay indicated, one of our major programs in the last 10 years which has been funded by industry money is looking at breeding ewe lambs at a younger age, um, eight months of age in New Zealand. We call them hoggets at that age. Uh, throughout the talk 
I'll call them new, new lambs, which is a more constant term across industries around the world, but if I accidentally use the word hoggit, I mean uh, ewe lambs. So I've had a large program look at all aspects from how to ensure they get pregnant at a young age through to how to ensure that breeding at a young age doesn't have negative consequences in their later life, resulting in being less productive or not as lasting as long in the flock, and also going through to looking at um, progeny born to these young ewes, uh, do they differ? And I'll touch on that uh, at the end of my presentation. Before I concentrate on just the ewe lamb aspect, I thought I'd just quickly summarise, for those of you who are interested, really the current state of the New Zealand industry, a little bit about it, just one slide. So the New Zealand uh, sheep industry, breeding ewes, like in many parts of, of the world, have declined, and this is a industry slide, and if you look back to 1990, there are about 40 million breeding ewes. We've dropped that to about 20 million breeding ewes, and to be honest, the, the new figures, because the figures are always a couple of years behind, we've just dropped below the 20 million, we're at the 19 million, and that's mainly because there's been a shift to dairy cattle production on flatter, more productive land, a shift to uh, viticulture, horticulture, and some vegetable growing enterprises on better quality land, and on some of the steeper hill topography uh, due to concerns about erosion and environmental aspects, the government has supported farmers transferring some of that land into forestry. So that has resulted, all of those aspects have resulted in a decrease in our, our ewe flock. The main decrease in the ewe flock though has been through that dairy cattle conversion. Um, however, we're very proud to show that in that period, if you look at the black line, it's pretty constant in terms of tons of carcass of lamb production across that time. So while ewe production numbers of ewes have dropped 50%, the total lamb carcass has only dropped about 7%. And that's because during that same period, um, We've got increased lamb growth rates to weaning, about 50 grams per day, if you look at industry averages. The carcass weights have moved. Traditionally, our carcass weights in New Zealand were quite light at around that 15, 16 kilo carcass. It's moved to 18, 19 kilos. And our lambing percentage has moved. And remember, all of our lambing occurs outdoors, extensive farming systems, from about just over 100 lambs per 100 ewes, or, or one lamb per ewe, to about one point three lambs per ewe. So that's allowed us to maintain our production. And also what those figures don't show is because the flatter, better country has gone to dairy, so an increased proportion of our herd, or flock, sorry, has moved to hill country. So those increases in performance are actually even more impressive, we would like to suggest, on poorer country. So that's basically where the flock is. The flock is starting to plateau. I think it'll plateau around the 18, 19 million use because most of the land that could easily be converted is converted. Also the regional bodies are starting to say in some areas we don't want more intensification with dairy cattle because of waterways, uh, intensification, nitrates, etc. And they're actually saying no more conversions, they've actually put in legislation. So we're probably about where we're going to end up. So sheep farming is always going to be important to New Zealand because of our topography. Um, we can no longer say that the sheep industry built New Zealand, uh, but it's still a significant component. So that's just a quick uh, background. So why breed you lambs? Now there's a number of reasons, and these reasons here that I have, these seven, were given to us by farmers. We uh, surveyed 4,000 farmers. Um, that were breeding new lambs, and these are the seven most common reasons. One is it's a way, and the main reason is to get a lamb out of the first year of the animal's life to increase productivity. So therefore you get more lambs on a, on a, on a given year available for sale on the farm. And in New Zealand, we lamb in spring, usually early spring, late winter. That's when a significant proportion of our herbage is, is grown. And it's a way of maximising the use of that herbage, because if you don't eat it, 
it actually loses quality and therefore it's less productive in terms of other classes of livestock later on if you don't consume it. So the more mouths or, or demand you have on your farm in spring, the greater your productivity. Um, farmers see it as a means of increasing the lifetime performance of the ewe and I'll touch on some data about that later on. Uh, but farmers certainly believe if they do it correct, they'll get more lambs out of that ewe's lifetime and therefore increase efficiency. Farmers see it as an early selection tool um, because if she is more fecund and fertile at a young age, she is generally, and there's data to back this up, she is more likely to be more fertile, fertile and fecund at a later date. There's a, a genetic linkage there. So for some farmers use a selection tool. And interestingly, a, a small proportion of our farmers, a small, about less than 5%, actually use a vasectomised male with their young ewe lambs um, with a mating harness, so he leaves a mark on her rump when he mounts her, just to see which ones are cycling, and they're the ones that, on these farms, they don't actually breed them at that age, but they're the ones they use as selection tool for animals that are genetically move more fertile, or more likely to keep them as replacements. Um, farmers are increasingly looking at keeping progeny from these ewe lambs, so the more ewe lambs that are born from either your mature flock or your ewe lambs, the more lambs are born, so therefore greater selection pressure you can apply. And of course from a genetic gain perspective, if you are selecting progeny born to a young ewe lamb, you're reducing the generation interval so you can make faster genetic uh, progress. So they are the main reasons farmers give. Of course, you know, that all sounds very positive, but only about a third of our farmers breed ewe lambs. So while many farmers say it's successful, um, there are those that either find it too hard or are concerned about the limitations. So the reason I have these two slides at the front of this talk is because this is what we did. We surveyed 8,000 farmers at, at, up front and, and got them to say, ask them, what are the reasons you do breed you lambs? What are the potential advantages? But most importantly, why don't you breed you lambs for those that don't do that? And then we built our 10-year research program around those answers. And one of the main reasons farmers say they don't breed you lambs is because they're low in variable reproductive performance, they're a lot lower than the mature ewe lambs, and, and the performance can be very variable, and we'll, we'll touch on factors causing that later on. It's the fact that if you have to breed them at a young age, there's more feed demand in that first year, and that actually puts more pressure on the farm as a whole. Um, and therefore, if you feed these young classes of stock extra, what are their impacts on other classes of stock, and how much extra do you need to feed them? And we'll touch on that. There was a fair bit of debate at the start. What is the actual weight, or size, or body condition score she needs to be to ensure she gets pregnant? And I'll discuss that. One of the biggest concerns farmers had, and, and the number one concern, even above that low and variable reproductive performance, is there's a perception by farmers if you breed her at a young age, um, you'll stunt her because there's extra demand in her first year. She will then have poorer, what we call two year old performance. Our farmers would call that two two performance, indicating the first two permanent size of performance, um, and that she's less likely to maintain in the flock for six or seven years, um, resulting in actually decreased lifetime performance. That was the biggest concern from farmers. And a lot of that's driven by that nutrition in the first year. So in fact, many of those first those first four points um, are actually inter interlocked. And also farmers were concerned, yes, you get an extra lamb, but the smaller at weaning, they're of lower value if you sell them at weaning, or they'll take extra food to get them to a suitable slaughter weight, so actually are you better off? So we did an aspect of work around that. So basically my talk is, is really based around the research we've done addressing those limitations and also either confirming those, some of those advantages, or if not confirming, actually developing systems to ensure those advantages actually do occur as, as perceived. I did also want to say that the sheep and beef industry and our industry body is called Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Because they funded our group for 10 years and they still fund us to look at a couple of aspects, they asked us to write a book. 
uh, as I said, ULAB, we call Hoggets in New Zealand. So that's the book there, and it's actually free as a PDF on the internet, um, which, and that's the dress that, that you could download. So many of the things I'm going to say today are actually in that book as well. Um, the book's in two, two parts. The front part is very much written for farmers or practitioners. The second half is, is more written for a science or a university or student-based audience with references, etc., around the actual science. So I do encourage you, if you're interested in reading new labs, um, or you do, um, do that. There'll be more information than what I can give in this 45 minutes in that book, and that's a freely available as a PDF at that address. And I also want to say up front, not all farmers should breed new lambs. And, and also I want to say, and this is a big issue for many of our farmers, should they do it every year? And, and I actually think, in comparison to your mature ewes, where you set the system, you do want to breed them every year, I really believe ewe lamb breeding should be a year-by-year -year decision. It needs to be a flexible policy, because it all depends, and I'll show some slides later, on the weight that you can get her, or her body condition, you can get her at eight months of age. If she is not at those minimum weights, which I'll discuss, you are setting yourself up to fail, and you're setting her up to fail, in terms of the carryover effects of not feeding her well enough, and her not being heavy, will be seen seen in terms of poorer, poorer two-year-old performance, and a lower likelihood that she'll be still in the flock at five to six years of age. We've shown this on three farms, very large farms. Each farm um, has 16 to 20,000 ewes on them, where they had 4,000 new lambs on each of these large farms that we followed through for the next six years. Um, and we looked at the impact of their live weight and condition score at 18 months of age when they were rebred after ewe lamb breeding, the impact on that based on whether they're going to be there at three, four, or five years of age. And just as a, as a quick summary, if they're only a body condition score of two, and I'm sure most of you know about body condition score, at 18 months of age, 40% of them will not be there at four years of age. So it all comes down to feeding during that first pregnancy and lactation, and the feeding prior to first breeding because that impacts on their breeding weight. And if there's only two points that you take away from the presentation today, it's about monitoring them to ensure they achieve those suitable live weight and body condition score targets, which I'll discuss. So points to, con to consider from when they themselves are weaned as a lamb, and in New Zealand they're generally weaned at 100 days, uh, to their first breeding at eight months of age. Now, this is always a controversial subject in New Zealand because we have individual farmers who are very proud of the breeds they use and they always defend their breed. So I never get into a discussion with farmers about what's the best breed because that's a, an argument one can never win. However, we do know via some work that we did on, on 800 farms that there are breed differences in their reproductive performance, and basically in the types of breeds we have in New Zealand, the Finn or the East Frisian and their composites for a given live weight show the highest performance, and that's whether they are the highest performers are those that are pure East Frisians or Finns, but even with only a quarter of those in a composite mix, um, they show higher performance than the traditional breeds. We have another composite breed which is quite popular in New Zealand, which is the Coopworth, which is actually traditionally a, a Romney, which is our main breed. It was crossed with the Border Leicester back in the 1950s and 60s to develop the Coopworth. It's the next best performer based on a given live weight. But the general rule is, because you'll have your different breeds, those breeds that are genetically more fecund and, fert and fertile, those same genes result in them being more likely to reach puberty at a given live weight, more likely to be more fertile and more fecund at a given live weight as a ewe lamb. So those breed types are more suitable to hogger breeding. However, I'd never suggest that a farmer should change their breed based uh, just for hogger breeding. Because we also know that within breeds there are 
significant variation in terms of fertility and fecundity. And then within breeds, there are lines uh, that are very suitable for hogger breeding or ewe lamb breeding. So um, if you are looking within your breed, if you look around when you're purchasing your, your, your ram, uh, rams, if you can get breeding values for some of the reproductive traits, they will have flow on effects in terms of ewe lamb breeding performance. So you can consider breed. The whole live weight um, comes down to basically for the New Zealand breeds, and, and I'll show this, this graph in a different way in a moment when you look at percentage of mature weight because your breeds will be different. But in New Zealand, the average breed mature weight for the breed types we have is somewhere around that 65 to 70 kilos. And if you look, look across the various breed types, and this data, this bold line is from 20,000 individuals, and then some modelling based on that, we see if you want to get somewhere between at least 80% of them pregnant, uh, you want to be a minimum of that 40 kilos at breeding at eight months of age. Once you start dropping below that 40 kilos, fertility, fecundity drops off. I've got a similar graph for fecundity, but it shows the same uh, relationship, so I'm not going to show it here today. But you want to be at least 40 kilos. That's looking at an animal that's that uh, 65 to 70% mature weight. So in those same 20,000 animals, that we then followed them through to four years of age so we could get their breeding weight at four years of age, because I think we would all agree at four years of age at breeding in a non-pregnant state, non-lactating state, Hopefully they're, they're displaying on average their mature weight. You can see there when you look at mature weight, you want to be around 60% of the mature weight to get 80% of them pregnant. So the takeaway point there is because everyone will have a different breed, type or composite. If you know what your mature weight for your breed is, if you simply back calculate to a minimum of 60% mature weight, that would be a good indicator of the live weight target that you need to get to, um, on average, to get about 80%. So when we're talking to farmers, we generally talk about making sure you're above that 60, somewhere between that 60 and 70% mature weight would be an ideal uh, area to be in at that eight months of age. If you want to get high performance, another, another tool our farmers use, of course, so they don't breed them all within their ewe lamb line, so they just breed those that are have that weight range and they just draft off those amount. Another way of looking at it, again, across those 20,000 animals was look at body condition score, and you see you get quite a drop off in performance below a body condition score of two and a half. Um, so again, that would suggest you don't want to breed an, a ewe lamb below a body condition score of two and a half because performance is poor. And if you actually think about the physiology behind puberty in all mammals, puberty is triggered when the, the brain believes that the animal is physiologically mature enough to cope with the pregnancy and lactation. One of the triggers that the brain uses is the level of adiposity or fat. And of course, body condition score is a subjective measure of body fat. So it is probable somewhere around that body condition score of two and a half that the body says, actually, I've got some body fat in this young animal, it's time to reach puberty on average. And, and so that's a good indicator. And I would argue that's actually a better indicator than live weight. Um, but either of those two tools you can use. So we always say to farmers, you know, in New Zealand, 40 kilos is the target, 1st of May. Uh, that's about when hoggets are bred in New Zealand on average. So if, you, if you're a ewe lamb, weaned about the 28 kilos in late December around Christmas, You've about got about 110 days to get to that 40 kilos. It sounds easy, and if you actually asked farmers, I'd say, oh, yes, my ewe lambs do that, but it's not that easy because, because you go through that summer-autumn period, and, and remember in New Zealand we're very much pasture-based, very little with no supplementation, so going through a summer-autumn can be difficult. And so the, the takeaway point there is to work out what your kilo is, whether it's 40 kilos, but if you're a different breed type, that's 60 to 70 percent mature weight. But the most important thing to do is to monitor them. So from when they're weaned, every month through to when you breed them, monitor a subset of them, see how they go. It's easy enough to draw a graph and say, this is where I am now in terms of average weight. This is where the weight needs to be 
at eight months of age, put a line through it, and then every month measure it and see whether you're above, below that line, and then make changes in your management in terms of your feeding, because what you feed will differ depending on what farming system you're in, to make sure you're there. Early you know you have a problem by the monitoring, the more likely you are to successfully fix that problem. It's no good a month out working out the four or five kilos behind where they should be, because it's going to be too uh, difficult to get them there. And of course, make sure you have appropriate health plans in place, including, if appropriate, the, the various vaccinations that, uh, that you need to ensure that you don't lose fetuses, etc. This is very much a New Zealand based uh, graph, but it, as I said, you can adjust this once you know what your mature weights are and, and make adjustments based on that 60 to 70%. But we say to farmers, you know, that's your 40 kilos. The day before she labs, she needs to be about 60 kilos. In the next slide, I'll, I'll discuss why that is, because then she, she'll drop the lamb and the, the associated pregnancy requirements, and it'll be a significant drop the next day. But in fact, when we talk about the 40 kilos here as being a target, actually an optimal scenario is to have her heavier than that, which I call scenario B. If you can get her heavier than that, that makes that management during pregnancy so much easier. Because as I'll allude to in a moment, you've got a young female that herself needs to grow. And the demands of pregnancy make it difficult for her to grow and meet the demands of pregnancy. So the heavier you have uh, her during pregnancy makes that important because you want her to get, in our scenario here, from that 40 kilos to 60 kilos the day before she lands because then you've fed her well enough to meet the requirements for pregnancy plus to allow her to grow. The biggest failure that New Zealand farmers have with ewe lamb breeding is that they fail to get her to that 60 odd kilos the day before she lambs. She lambs and they work out she's in her mid 40 kilos, not you know mid to low 40s, not 50 kilos. And it's a hell of a large struggle to feed her, to get her through lactation, where again it's difficult for her to grow, wean her in the summer and then get her to that 60 kilos again or 65 kilos at rebreeding. So the easiest approach is actually to have a heavier target weight well above the 40 kilos so that if you do that, yes, they'll get pregnant, but importantly, it makes the management easier through pregnancy and lactation and ensures she grows. Because a side effect of her not growing to that 60 kilos is she's smaller and she'll have greater difficulty, she'll have more difficulty actually lambing and expelling that fetus and having more dystocia problems. Um, and I've just put this, this, this graph here because how you feed them is very much dependent on what feed you have available. And, and your various scenarios will be a lot different than where we are here in New Zealand, uh, where we're very much herbage-based. But there's, there's plenty of data out there available that shows you for different feed types the value of those feed types in terms of the ME, which of course the energy drives in our environment land growth or growth of the young female, drives how fast she will grow. So. In our scenario, if I were talking to farmers, I'd be talking about making sure that good quality grass with a lot of clover in it, or different crops like lucerne, etc., or specific uh, feeds available, such as some as the brassicas, to, to make sure that she grows well enough pre-breeding and during and mid-pregnancy, early pregnancy, and late pregnancy. But in your environment, they, they will differ. But that's very important to have the feed source sorted in advance. So breeding, one of the biggest issues is she's a young female, she's naive, she's less likely to seek the male, she's on heat or estrus for a shorter period, she's less likely to stand. So there's a whole lot of reasons why pregnancy rates are poor. Um, exposing the young female to a teaser or vasectomized male for 17 days uh, prior to breeding, yes, has the advantage of those that are already cycling and are getting used to standing for the male. For those that haven't started to cycle, that exposure, and the 17 days is important because that's the length of a reproductive cycle of a sheep, those are, are about to spontaneously go into um, puberty because they're almost heavy enough, uh, that will advance that. Ensure, ensure that when the ram goes in 17 days later, they've had one silent ovulation, 
they'll have an overt or estrus uh, breeding period in those first couple of days when the ram's in, and then get pregnant early in the breeding period. Of course, hopefully you've reached, you've made sure they're already that 60 to 70 percent closer to 70 percent of their mature weight, and therefore under those conditions the the, the teaser will do very little. Towards 60 percent, you, you'll get more of an effect from teaser. It's important that the teaser is not there for longer than 17 days because if he's there for longer than 17 days he'll have that effect uh, slightly earlier and then the female, the young will cycle at the wrong time. You actually want her cycling within the first two or three days that the entire ram is, is placed in there so she gets pregnant as early as possible in the mating period. So the 17 days is important for that. Um, and there's, we've done a whole lot of work with teasers and, and you get more pregnant, you get more pregnant earlier. The ideal ratio and again, we have larger flocks, is one teaser per 75 ewe lambs, but they are still effective, not quite as effective, but right out to ratios of 1 to 200. And obviously, if your flock's large enough, having a team is better than, than one. I would say, though, that teasers should not be used as a short term fix if you're poor live weights. You know, and, and that with our breeds, using a teaser can induce them into puberty around the 33, 35, 36 kilos, no problem. But just, yes, they'll get pregnant, but you're setting yourself up to fail and them to fail because they're a long way off that target weight that they need to be in late pregnancy and in lactation. So don't use a teaser as a short-term fix because you think, oh, they're not heavy enough, they're not cycling, I need to put the ram out, I'll get them cycling by using a teaser and then I'll sort the feeding out later. It just doesn't work. There are so many examples of that going wrong, and it often drives why farmers say, oh, that I did ewe lamb breeding, I ended up with poor two-year-olds, I'm never doing that again. But actually it's because I bred them at too uh, lighter age, and often through the teaser. Um, as I said, once it gets to breeding, they are shy breeders, they're less likely to stand and seek the male, etc., and they're on heat for a shorter period, so they get less opportunity to get uh, pregnant. So we've done a number of studies, in New Zealand, the optimal ratio for mature ewes is around one ram to 100 mature ewes in teens. Um, ewe lambs around that 1 to 50 to 1 to 75. Going below 1 to 50 didn't improve pregnancy rates. It just increased costs. We would also argue that you use team, teams of rams rather than single side mating. Using ram lambs with ewe lambs, we've done a number of studies. Again, you're using a young ram that's not so accustomed to breeding, his seminal reserves aren't as great, his capacity is not as great, so they're not an ideal combination in terms of pregnancy rates. So that's where you would go down to 1 to 30 or so ratio. But again, you'd need to make sure your ram lambs are at least that 65 to 70% of their mature weight so that they've reached puberty and have a good viability in terms of their sperm. What our farmers generally do in New Zealand is, rather than having specific rams uh, for ewe lamb breeding, they often use the same rams that use. So the mature ewes are generally bred a month earlier. Um, our ewe lambs are bred a month later to get them to ensure they get to those decent weights, um, and they end up re reusing the same rams. So rams that have been used for you know, 17 days or so with the mature ewes and you know, most of the breeding occurs in that first 17 days, when we've reused them, um, even for 34 days, used them and then reused them into, into ewe lamb breeding, pregnancy rates have been just as high as fresh, unused rams, because a mature ram has a huge capacity. And we've done an examination of, of, of the semen as well. So you can reuse those mature rams as, as a good option if um, you don't have specific rams available and they can be just as effective um, as I said, the, 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 use those 1 to 50 to 1 to 75 ratios in teams. But you don't need specific saved up rams. Ram choice. Ram choice is important, I would argue, more for the chance of that young female, female who, from a pelvic opening perspective, is not as mature and is therefore structurally not as large. Therefore, they've got a fetus growing in them. And at the end of the day, the fetus is the is a word you could use, is a 
parasite living inside it. You know, the fetus will just keep sucking and sucking. Once it is genetically set up, the genes it's got from its mother and father, it just wants to grow, and it'll take everything to grow. And we've all seen ewes go down with pregnancy toxemia or metabolic disease or sleepy sickness. I'm not sure what it's called in the US, but those metabolic problems you see in late pregnancy is because the fetus just wants to grow and the mother just wants to give. And so if you use the wrong RAM choice, you'll end up with a fetus in there that wants to grow. In a young female, that'll give that growth. But she's not set up structurally to push out that, that fetus, and you'll get that difficult birth to stoke your issue. So RAM choice is very important. And so ideally, the choice of RAM would be a RAM of at least the same frame size, so in other words, the same breed, or a step down in breeds we would advocate. If you're going to do some RAM choice, this is where you do it, you'd use a, a RAM from a breed that's structurally slightly smaller than the breed of the ewe. Um, so don't use the larger terminal cytotypes. And farmers say, oh, no, no, that's wrong, it's all about feeding. Now I can tell you we've done numerous studies and published these studies as well where we've had young ewes that have either put on 10 kilos, 20 kilos, 30 kilos, or ridiculously 40 kilos in pregnancy. And the weight of those fetuses, or those lambs when they're born, only differs by 200 grams across ewes that differ in weight the day before the lamb by 40 kilos. That just shows you it's more of a genetic driver for growth of the fetus than it is nutrition. So never be scared about overfeeding the ewe lamb in pregnancy. I'll talk about when you should feed her in a moment, but if you're getting big lambs, it's about the sire choice. It's in some countries, I'm not sure about the US, but there are some breeding values that you can get for birth size in lambs, like you can in beef cattle and dairy cattle. Um, if, if you had access to those, you, you'd use that information, but often you can't within some of the breeds, and therefore you'd look at stepping down a breed size to, to reduce that issue, which is a, a production issue and, and a clear welfare issue. I also say to farmers, many farmers get excited because they can get their ewe lambs to 40 or 40 plus kilos at breeding and they say, yes, we've won the game. And in fact, the match or the game has just started. All you've done is allowed that ewe lamb to get to the start line. If you want to be successful, you've just started. You've actually got to feed them throughout pregnancy. You've got to feed her in pregnancy and lactation. So yes, she meets the requirement for a fetus or the milking requirements for her lambs and lactation but she needs to grow herself. Because really, an analogy you could use here, you've got a teenager that is not mature, that's got to grow, and you want her to grow, otherwise some of those advantages in terms of lifetime performance won't occur. So you've got to keep her to feed her well in pre around breeding and in early pregnancy and late pregnancy. Feeding her well in around breeding is not to get a flushing effect or an ovulation effect. There is no data, we've tried this, to show that doing that flushing effect as you might traditionally do with mature ewes, doesn't result in extra fetuses from the ewes, per se, from the flushing. You'll get extra fetuses because in your flock because what you're doing is getting more of them to a suitable weight, or you get more of them heavy enough that they move into the twinnings, but there's no, no flushing effect, per se. The effect you get is that more of those lighter ones during that breeding period get up to that 60 percent of mature weight and then spontaneous reach puberty and, and get pregnant. So that's the advantage of early nutrition, uh, but the real advantage is so that she continues to grow so she gets those good weights. Because as I'll show here, managing pregnancy, management pregnancy is all about nutrition. So with a mature weight, uh, with our mature ewes, you know, traditionally we hold them at uh, their weight uh, and their nutrition first through the first two thirds of pregnancy, and I'll show a slide why in a moment. We can do this because they've reached their mature weight. Because if we look at this very stylized uh, graph, um, here we see this is the weight of the other UC, this is days of pregnancy. And I know the average baby pregnancy is around about 147 days, but creating these graphs, it's easier if you use uh, even numbers. So this is the udder weight as it develops. Uh, this is the, the fetus weight. It is 
negligible before day 50. It's it's in the you know couple of hundred grams, and this is the placenta weight through here. And you can see in the first 50 days of pregnancy, the first trimester, there's very little weight in pregnancy. Um, it increases in the middle trimester, and then a significant um, weight increase in the last third. And so basically what we've traditionally done is we've concentrated on the last third of pregnancy is our feeding period for the mature ewe because in reality, in New Zealand at least, early and mid-pregnancy is winter, there's not a lot of feed, you're saving that feed up in terms of pasture to later on, and the mature ewe can buffer during those first 100, 110 days. You can't do that with a young female because she needs to grow in those first those those first 110 days. So what I would argue is in that first 100 days, and if you look at my graph here, the scenario A or B, that's through the May, June, July, August period, that's when she's growing. So you want to feed her so that she's growing. You know, it's never going to get be partitioned toward the fetus because the fetus is programmed to have only little bits of growth during that period because it doesn't need to grow. The mammary gland isn't going to develop during that period. The placenta only really starts to grow at any significant uh, growth between days 50 and 90. So that first third of gestation, if she's putting on 100, 130 grams per day, that's about her growing, and that's what you want. So she's structurally growing. And then in the last third, that fetus is going to eat all that food. So yes, she'll put on 100, you know, if you feed her really well, she'll put on that 130 grams per day. But in reality, the vast majority of that is, is actually going towards the fetus, the conceptus, the placenta, the fluids associated with that, and she's not growing. So in the last 30, 40 days, she won't grow. And so if you haven't grown her in that early two-thirds, what you're doing there is setting her up for a large fetus, because it's going to happen anyway, but she has a growing, she's going to have those birthing difficulties. And of course the day after she lambs, she's going to lose all that fluid that's associated uh, with the fetus, the fetus itself and, and the, the, the conceptus, all that fluid. And of course you're, you're stuck with, it, with, it, with a light female that has a lot of growth to go. So feeding her needs to be throughout pregnancy. And so we can't just concentrate on that large, large third. And that's probably the biggest change we've seen in New Zealand farmers in the last 10 years is they've begun to realise that. And that's where they're seeing greater lifts in performance in terms of uh, the young ewe lamb herself, the chance that she's successfully going to uh, wean a lamb, and therefore the chance that she's going to be successful at two years of age and later in the flock. They're putting significant more effort into feeding her in, in the first two thirds of pregnancy. And so if you make some assumptions, and I'm sorry, I do see there's some comments about, of course, you're in pounds. What I'll do is before I send this back to Jay, um, I will make some changes in the slides so they're in pounds as well. Um, but if, if we make some adjustments, uh, make some assumptions, if she's 40 kilos in pregnancy, she needs to put on 10 kilos in pregnancy because that, for a single fetus, that's a four kilo fetus. If you look at the weight of the, the conceptus, which is the placenta and the associated fluids, that's about 10 kilos. So that all goes pretty much the day the day she lands, um, or the day after as the, as the placenta, and, and therefore the uterus regresses. So 10 kilos of the weight change you see from day of breeding to the day she lands associated with that. So she needs to put on another 10 kilos of her self-growth, as a ballpark figures, um, because you want her to be 50 kilos the day she lands, because you need her to put on another 50 to, sorry, 10 to 15 kilos between when she lambs, which will be at 13 months, uh, to when she's rebred, because then in New Zealand we bring her back in to when the rest of the flock breed at 18 to 19 months of age, she needs to put on that weight. So she's at that weight at 18 to 19, uh, 18 to 19 months, which isn't easy. So it's another reason for having that good growth during pregnancy. So that's what we would say to our farmers, that you should target her to be putting on about that much uh, weight during the pregnancy period, which isn't easy, and again, why many of our farmers don't breed ewe lambs. So in, in our scenario, um, we would argue under pastoral grazing in New Zealand that you uh, would graze, offer them more than 12,000 kilograms, uh, which is about a four centimetre height of our ryegrass white clover swords, um, and don't graze below three 
centimetres or a thousand. So we've done a number of, of studies to show that. Um, and of course, that won't um, work for your grazing scenarios and your feeding scenarios. But the point to take out of the talk is not actually what the grazing conditions are in New Zealand, is that that's about the gain you need and you can adjust that based on your mature uh, flock uh, weight um, and then look at what feed sources you use. And of course, again, it's about monitoring. So we've done lots of studies to show you the other weights your ball park need to achieve if you want high performance. And then you can map that out yourself and make adjustments to what those weights are for your breed type. And then look at, under your individual farming scenarios, what feed sources and amounts of feeds you would use to ensure that was achieved. And of course, like any scenario, you need to look at the cost effectiveness of that. And for some of our environments in New Zealand, it's just not cost effective enough to actually put that extra feed into those ewe lambs when that extra feed might be better going into mature ewes that have got twins and triplets to ensure that. What this graph shows, and each of those dots uh, represent an animal, and in fact there's many animals, there's actually 12,000 dots there. Um, but this is the live weight three weeks pre lambing we call it set stocking in New Zealand. So that's about when we'd start be putting her in the paddock. So I'll put this heading at the bottom. And that's the chance of her successfully rearing the lamb. We would call that being wet dry in New Zealand. If she's pregnant, we call her wet. If she loses that lamb at by tailing, so at about four to six weeks of age, we call her a wet dry. So an animal that uh, was pregnant and successfully kept that lamb. So if you look at these weights, and again, there's 14,000 animals, um, the the midline is the average. Uh, sorry, these are three different farms, each with those 4,000 animals. Um, you can see this variation between farms, but the general trend is the lighter she is three weeks pre lambing, the greater the chance she will not successfully rear that lamb. Now, if you're going to go to the effort of getting her pregnant you, and feeding her extra so she gets to that target weight for breeding, you want a lamb to be successfully there at weaning. Um, and so what this clearly shows to New Zealand farmers is that the lighter she is going into those three weeks pre-lambing, and of course she'll gain a lot of weight in those three weeks pre-lambing, this is a fair bit of weight to go, that the poorer the chance is that she's successfully going to have a lamb. So that's again nicely why I talk about that 60 under our scenario, weight that she needs to be because then you're only, I mean, we're, we're outdoors lambing with very little assistance, on average, you know, 10% loss. So that's how we get to some of those targets. And if you don't get there, you know, she's going to be less likely to, to rear that lamb. And of course, if you don't get there, there's the flow on effects into later years in terms of what her performance will be and, and whether she'll successfully be there in later years. You know, we're, we're all out door lambing, so it's about, if she's a young female, she's going to give birth to a smaller lamb. These lambs are on average one to one and a half kilos smaller, so they have a greater surface area to body mass ratio, which means they're more susceptible to a cold environment. They have less body reserves. So in our environment, it's important that we provide shelter. So paddocks that have shelter, if you're indoors, I mean, that counters that anyway. Um, and we also have minimum feeding targets, and again, as I said, um, that's because we're pasture based. We know that in a young new lamb, because we've milked them and we've done lamb growth studies, in our environment, with ryegrass white, white clover, as long as you don't let the covers go below 1200 kilograms, that's dry matter to ground level, or four centimetres if you measure it with a ruler or a sword stick, we would call them in New Zealand, um, you'll maximise the milk production that you lamb, you'll maximise the weight of her lamb at weaning and of course the weight that she is, because that's important for flow on effects. So we've done a number of studies and in our environment, in our conditions, they are the guidelines. And so that's that point uh, just reiterated. We've done a lot of work in the last four or five years because even under those conditions of pasture, that four centimetre it's disappointing the results in terms of weaning weights. And so our farmers are, do use alternative herbages for finishing lambs post weaning. 
So we've said, well, if you're going to have these anyway, why don't we lamb your new lambs on that? And it's been very successful with these different pastures, species, whether that's chicory or plantain, red and white clover mixes, or lucerne, which you call alfalfa. Um, we've been very successful <coughs> sorry, at lambing on these, or moving new lambs and their lambs onto these, about three weeks of age. Um, and in these conditions, we've increased milk production, we've increased the uh, weight of the lambs from the ewe lambs and the weight of um, the ewe lamb itself in comparison to those that optimal target under ryegrass white clover. So we see that the, the better producers now uh, are using these herbages not just for finishing lambs post weaning, but actually if it's on their farm anyway, that's the, the class of stock they would use, uh, or livestock they would use in the spring period to, to maximise that outcome. Also, what many of our farmers are doing with our mature ewes, as I said, we uh, wean our lambs at 100 days of age at around that 28 kilos. Many of our farmers are saying, well, the ewe lamb, she lambs a month later but has to rebreed at the same time once she becomes an 18 month old ewe as the mature ewe flock. So why not actually wean slightly earlier to give her more time to recover? Because, of course, um, lactation itself is an energy draw on her and it's harder for her to gain weight. So we see that these lambs born to these ewe lambs, people, farmers, producers, uh, wean them slightly at a younger age than we would expect to see with a mature ewe, um, at a lighter weight, obviously, because she has a lower milk production um, than a mature ewe. So rather than weaning these lambs at 100 days at 28 kilos, we often see the, 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 the weanings around 70 days at around 22 kilos. And if it then goes into it, and she's weaned, giving her more time to recover, an extra month to recover before she's rebred, and if it going into feeding those those lambs post that early weaning. You, again, using often uh, either a lot of clover and, and ryegrass clover sward or some of those plants I alluded to on, on the previous slide. It's a high quality feed for the young. Ruminant, whatever that is. So that's the basic system. Um, of course, there's long term impact. So that's the basic system until you wean her. And they are the targets. But it's actually rather simple if you conceptually bring it down to its underpinning principle, and it's about live weight. It's about making sure you have determined what that target weight is at breeding for your various breed types making sure she's at least achieved that, monitoring her so she, she does achieve that from when she's weaned herself to when she is bred, and then ensuring that she continues to grow throughout pregnancy, starting from the day you breed her. The game has just started then, it's not over. And again, monitoring those young females to make sure they reach those targets. If you don't reach those targets, you're setting her up to fail in terms of being successful from rearing a lamb, you're setting that lamb up to fail in terms of it being small and then requiring extra feed, which affects the efficiency on your farming system. And you're setting her up to be lighter at next breeding at 18 months of age, which will mean she'll have poor performance at 18 months of age. And those long-term studies have shown she's less likely to be there at four to five years of age because of a number of reasons, because you've set her up to fail. And then when you look at lifetime performance, it'll be disappointing. And you won't, you'll end up being no better off. I mean, if you're going to breed your lambs, the target is to get increased lifetime productivity from the ewe. And you're only going to get that if you get those those targets. And, and a number of studies on large farms where ewe lambs, you know, for every 100 pregnant, we end up with about 80 to 90 lambs weaned, or about 80 90 percent lamb percentage per 100 pregnant in their first years. So that's about the average. Um, some, some breed types where they're more for can have more twins, and we do have some farms achieving 110, 120% um, with the ewe lambs pregnant. Um, but where you want to end up is that you've met those live weight targets. So when you do breed her at 18 months of age, she's no more than four kilos behind what you would expect a normal female would be if you were breeding her for the first time at that age. If she is greater than that, our data shows that her performance will be will be uh, worse, and she
and she's less likely to be there. So you want to be within that four to five kilo range, which is almost about a half a condition score unit. Um, and in most breeds, a whole condition score is around about that seven, eight kilo. So around about half a kilo, uh, sorry, half a body condition score. You want her to be within that. Because in the large studies, which actually matches work done in the US, done in other bits in the world, and done in New Zealand in the 1970s and 1980s when there was interest in breeding new lambs then, they showed, as, as our work did in the last five to ten years, is that the lifetime performance by breeding a ewe lamb is only around that one extra lamb. Which means that one extra lamb you get out in her lifetime is really only that one extra lamb she achieves in that first uh, year. There's only about a 0 0.2, 0 0.3 extra lambs over her lifetime, and as most of it's in that first uh, or that second year, you breed her at 18 months of age because she's a slightly better mother. Um, so lamb survival is slightly up because she's been through the process once. The lifetime effect isn't huge and it's mainly based on first year's performance. And first year's performance is all based on those live weight targets. I do want to say there's a perception out there though that, that many farmers say, oh, if we breed her in the first year, or producers say, she ends up being stunted for life. If you're within only those four or five kilos of what she should be, it's not stunted. We've, you know, we've monitored thousands of animals and, and, and she does catch it up. So that by her next breeding um, at um, 30, 31 months of age to lamb at three years of age, that's, that, that weight is, is gone. She catches that up. So it's not a permanent stunting at all. Um, however, if she's well behind, um, what tends to happen is that the farmer culls her based on performance. Um, in terms of not being pregnant, less likely to wean a lamb, etc. And so she therefore doesn't catch up because she has been culled. One question we, we're always asked is do they differ mature ewes and new lambs in terms of their progeny? Yes, they are lighter. And they're lighter to about 12 years of age, but we've actually followed them through for their lifetime. And our data suggests, is, except for twins, which there seems to be a permanent stunting of about three or four kilos, if you're born as a twin from a mature ewe, uh, you're, born, you're born smaller, you're weaned lighter, etc. And it does, that is a permanent stunting um, past one year of age. Um, however, even though they're stunted, they're genetically the same, of course, so it's just a stunting effect. Um, and their, their performance, in terms of their lifetime performance, up to we've got some two flocks where we've followed to five years of age, is no worse off. So, what we can actually say to farmers is, Actually, getting progeny born to ewe lambs, they can be just as good a progeny. Their performance isn't poorer, like the farmer perception is. And yes, they might be slightly smaller, but they're genetically, as, as you'd expect, um, so their performance is actually no worse off. And even though they're five kilos lighter, they're no worse off, so you could actually argue they're more efficient. Um, so we're following those two flocks through uh, just to confirm that. But there is no reason why you shouldn't keep progeny born to ewe lambs, our studies are showing, which actually, again, matches some studies that were done 20 or 30 years ago. Um, however, of course, because they're lighter to 12 months of age, it does make it more difficult to breed progeny from a ewe lamb themselves because they are lighter. So a lot more extra food has to go in because they will be lighter um, and they're born a month behind. So there is extra food resource that's required to put in there. So I think that's all I wanted to say. So ewe lamb breeding has the potential to improve lamb productivity. There is no single uh, magic bullet. Um, I didn't talk about some of the uh, abortion issues they can have in New Zealand. Most of that based around abortive diseases. When we've reached those live weight targets, we haven't had those issues. Um, but there are a number of little things you can do around breed types. You know, the, the teaser, getting your RAM ratios right, etc. But the major driving of success is around those live weight targets and body condition score targets. If you get those right, your performance will be good and it'll be good in, in future years. So I think that's all I want to say, Jay, and I've probably talked for too long. Okay. Well, thank you, Paul. And uh, let me uh, uh, start by just asking you, you mentioned the book that had a lot of material in it at the beginning. You want to give another <coughs> plug for that and let everybody know where they can find that? I assume it's on Amazon.com. No, no. So, so that book is, is on our Beef and Lamb, which is our industry goods website. Okay. And you can download it as a free PDF. 
Um, so, so yeah. So the, the the way to get it would be as a free PDF because the the industry uh, good beef and lamb New Zealand just made it free to all New Zealand farmers. So New Zealand farmers got uh, could either ask for one via that website and they get a hard copy sent out. They get asked what their farmer number is, which which your viewers won't have. However, it's actually free to the world as a PDF on there, so you can can download it free. Okay. Um, and then either, either print it yourself or just look at it on on screen. All right, awesome. And, and that that website's there. That that full link is there underneath the book. Okay. Um, okay. First one is a softball because I think you answered this at the tail end. Uh, if we are to stay yearly breeding. The breeding ewe lambs happen six and a half to seven months of age, so they'll be lambing a month later. So the yeah. solution then is to, or the suggestion is to early wean. Is that, uh, or? That, that, that's right, because what we've found, and we've done some milking studies, is that you can leave the, the lamb with the ewe, and, and we all feel nice about that. But if you actually look at the lactation curve of the young ewe lamb, she's producing very little milk. Because, because of her age and, and, and mammogenesis and what we see. So actually, once you get past that 70 days, the lamb is actually getting very little benefit from the milk itself. And so the lamb and the predator to feed source, okay. um, which, is, which is an ideal. Um, and so then uh, we see that there's no benefit. And in fact, if you actually wean the lamb, on even on the same pasture that you got the ewe and the lamb on, the 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 the, the growth of that lamb is no worse off. But she's better off because she's no longer putting energy into into lactation, uh, so she gains some weight and some body condition, which helps with the next rebreeding and that performance. So yeah. Okay. We so know. next question is uh, by selecting for heavier weights at a younger age in order to reach breeding weight, are we also then selecting for bigger mature ewes as well as a more fer fertile ewe? Yeah, so that, that, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. So that's the risk. You, you, we run the risk that you end up sex for a genetically larger animal. Of course, what that does then is that your your target weight um, actually increases because it's still at 60%, 70%. So what the way around that is 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 you keep doing your your selection based on the breed type you want and, and the breeder that supplies the ram and and you make sure your ewes are no heavier that way, um, because oh, your rams are no heavier than traditionally, and if you can get the breeding values from mature weight, um, you hold that there. So it's about feeding them so that they get to that that trigger of 60 to 70 percent at a lighter weight, without then necessarily blowing out your mature weight. Because if you blow out your mature weight, um, then you, from an efficiency point of view, you've lost any gain most likely. So, so what you're really doing is probably the easiest explanation is you're feeding them so that they get, hopefully feeding them well, so they get that 60% earlier, so they can express their genetic potential to be bred at, a, at an earlier age. If you then go on to use that as a selection tool, um, because some farmers do, I didn't say this, but they overmate, which means, it's a term we use in New Zealand, Let's pretend you wanted, again our farms are bigger, but let's pretend you wanted 500 ewe lamb replacements. You actually keep 700, you put the ram out with them. The 500 that get pregnant, you keep them as replacements. Those other 200 you sell for probably for slaughter. Um, that is then a tool to increase your uh, genetic uh, gain and reproduction because you're selecting those for a given weight because hopefully those animals are of a similar weight. You've got them all to that target. For a similar weight, which of those are more genetically more fertile, and they're probably going to be genetically more fecund as well. Okay. Um, have you done studies with ewe lambs bred at one year of age as compared to eight months? Uh, just a comparison and, you know, equal <coughs> genetics. No, we, we haven't. Well, we haven't because that would put our farmer's system out in terms of it would be too difficult to get them back to, to realign with breeding. Uh, at the 18 months of, for their second breeding. Uh, but there has been work done internationally uh, to show that if you're in a system where you're not so held for your breeding timing, because we're quite seasonal, so we need to be, that yes, waiting to that one year of age, they're physiologically more mature, 
uh, they're uh, physiologically more capable to cope with the pregnancy. Hopefully you feed them well enough so they'll be even bigger, largely structurally bigger as well. So your performance will be slightly better. Yep. And okay. so therefore in a system where you're not so controlled by the season, you can slowly over a couple of years get them back into the normal alignment in terms okay. of by creeping them up each year back on them. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to, I, I apologize, I forgot to go over it with our listeners, but you can raise your hand and, and, and talk to directly to Dr. Kenyon to ask a question. We do have a listener with, with her hand out, uh, Margaret. I uh, don't know if you're out there and still have that question, but I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone, Margaret, and if you uh, are there. Um, Margaret? I don't know if you're picking you are. Okay, we're getting an echo there, so I'm going to make sure that if uh, if we do call on you that you uh, lower your uh, um, uh, speakers here so we don't get that echo on it. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, let's see. Let's go back to the questions here. Does differences in tail docking length affect prolapse issues? A little bit off topic, but that'll work. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a, we were actually having that discussion yesterday because I was one of our research flocks. We were tail docking, and we were explaining that to students that does. So uh, if you go too short, um, there is some evidence to suggest that you are more likely to get prolapse issues. So in New Zealand, it's a requirement that tail docking, the tail is left long enough so it covers the vagina vulva area. Uh, and that seems to deal with some of those, that issue. Mm -hmm. If you go too short, then there has been some evidence of an issue. Also going too short exposes that area for, uh, and those environments, environments have a lot of sun, uh, to things like skin damage and cancer, etc. So it's a requirement in New Zealand that the tail is left so that covers the vulva. Okay. Um, question on how many days do you leave the ram in with the ewes, with the ewe lambs in yes. particular? Yeah, I, I noticed I missed that slide, so I'll make sure I put that back in it. I thought I had that in there and I apologise for that. So there's two approaches. Um, some farmers use the 34 days which is the uh, two reproductive cycles so each ewe lamb has two, two, two chances. Some farmers, the other cohort of farmers or producers would argue all that does is prolong the pregnancy and lactation period for those late lambing ewes and gives them less time to get back with the rest of the flock in terms of, you know, if they lamb later, uh, she's got less time to recover before you rebreed her at 18 to 19 months of age. So what farmers tend to do if they use the teaser or vasectomized ram approach is that they reduce the breeding period to around, uh, around about 26, 27 days because if they respond to the teaser, um, they will respond in the breeding period, they'll, they'll display estrus or a heat or stand for the male in the first six or seven days, and then they get another seven. If they don't get pregnant, that, they get another 17 days later to get pregnant. Uh, breeding opportunity, which is around day 23, 24, 22, which is in that envelope of 26, 27 days. So, so you see farmers shorten up the breeding period to to limit the numbers of those late lambing ewe lambs that then have less time to recover. So, either somewhere between that 26. 27 days if you're using a teaser or up to the 34 days. No one goes above the 34 days because, as I said, they're already lambing a, a month later than the mature new flock. Okay, a question on the size and increasing feed intake. Will increased feed intake result in larger lambs born and more dystocia? Have you seen any evidence of that? So, yes, yeah, so I, I touched on that a little bit. So. Increased nutrition, if you feed her well, will increase birth weight by somewhere on average between two and three hundred grams of a four to five kilo lamb, depending on your breed type. So that's uh, five or so percent. However, if you can feed her well in early to mid pregnancy and ensure she's at suitable breeding weight at the start, um, so she's heavy, she'll be structurally larger and that that extra two to three hundred grams of that lamb won't cause dystopia. 
what causes dystocia is the genetics of the ulam and the combination of genetics that the fetus gets from its dam and sire, which program it, to use a better word, to want to grow. And as I alluded to, that, that fetus is a parasite. At the end of the day, you know, it just keeps sucking and sucking and mum keeps giving and giving and it keeps growing and growing. Um, so the lamb is pretty much set within two or three hundred grams what its birth weight's going to be, you know, at conception. And so overfeeding or, or feeding a high level is not going to change that much. I would argue, in fact, underfeeding or not feeding at appropriate level so that she uh, doesn't grow appropriately, resulting in her being structurally large, resulting in a larger pelvic opening, is what sets you up to fail instead of dystocia. Because you know the, the traditional approach in New Zealand farmers was for a long time, don't overfeed her, don't overfeed her, let's keep the lamb small, but that doesn't work. We've shown that. There's, there's work in, in the US showing that, there's work in Ireland, there's work in Australia. That doesn't work because it's the genetics that controls the size of that fetus. So I would say don't be scared about feeding you good amounts, but make sure you're feeding those those those, those levels in early and mid-pregnancy when she grows when the pregnancy doesn't need it. Need it. Okay. And we got some New Zealand questions here. Uh, no problem. Got a, some listeners from Hawaii that are aching to ask some questions here, so I'll, they're interested in specifically fly strike and foot scald. Uh, do, uh, something on fly strike here: Does shearing to keep the hair or wool short help to prevent fly strike on the backs of animals? Any other recommendations on fly strike in terms of insecticides or how to uh, Sorry, prevent it? Sorry. And yep. then similar on foot rock, foot scald: How do you prevent that in animals? So, so in terms of fly strike, we use shearing timing and frequency. Um, so yes, the, the shorter the wool, uh, the less likely fecal matter will attach to it, uh, mud, um, therefore also that, that area will be dry, um, so less likely there's anything for the, the larvae or the maggots from the fly to, to or less likely for the, the fly to be attracted to the smell and less likely for that the maggot would have moisture which it needs to start with. So we use shearing uh, timing as a, as a major tool to limit fly strike. Uh, we also use crunching, so that's removal of wool around the tail bridge area and under the belly is another tool. So some farmers would uh, traditionally say in, in my environment, where we are here in my district, would be shearing around Christmas, uh, post weaning, um, and that would give you four to six weeks protection. They would then um, apply, uh, apply some insecticides um, that, that we have available in New Zealand. There's various insecticides. There's those that um, either inhibit the eggs from laying. There's those that discourage the fly from laying. There's those that don't let the larvae get, go past a certain stage. There's a whole lot of products available that uh, give protection from anywhere from two weeks to two months protection, um, and, and farmers use those uh, as, as tools, um, as, as our main uh, tool. There is a push in New Zealand at the moment. There are some breeds that uh, one of the traits that they have are very less wool around the tail of the bridge area, uh, which we uh, call a, a more easy care sheep. So they've got less wool around the tail and bridge, which also has advantages around the lambing period as well. Um, and so they get less dags or fetal matter attaching and therefore they get less fry strike. Um, so they're, they're the main approaches. For those farmers who are shearing at different times of the year, main fly strike season for us is summer, autumn. If they're not shearing then they at least do that crunching around the tail at, in that period is protecting. Um, and again that gives four or six week protection and sometimes they do that more than once. <coughs> Around skull, that, that, that is an issue, but not a large issue in New Zealand because of our breed types have adapted to our environment. Uh, we don't see it a lot. We sometimes see it in lambs around spring when they're born. If it's wetter, uh, we have zinc, zinc baths, zinc-based baths uh, that uh, farmers use on occasion. But most of our breeds um, don't have much of a skull problem. The merino-based breeds do, but they tend to be in the drier environments where scold is not such a problem in New Zealand. 
Okay, uh, parasite question, treatment question, Barbervax, do you guys have that over there and is it working if you do? Are you familiar with um, that at all? No, we don't have Barbervax, I'm not sure what that is. Okay. Uh, it might be a trade name and we just have a different trade name. We uh, have a significant range of anthelmintics mm -hmm. and, and, and I know we have some that have not been released yet in the US, um, but even with all of those, um, there's still potential for resistance, and it's about how you use those, R rotating your families of drench, uh, etc. Is, is, is a big, big emphasis for our farmers to minimise drench resistance, if that's the question. Okay. Um, in terms of supplementing on pasture, if your pasture does not have enough energy, are you guys supplementing with grain or anything like that over there? So, so yes. So th there is a small bit of supplementation. So in, in the dry areas, and if they have significant droughts, we, we get grain supplementation does occur. Uh, unfortunately for New Zealand, because of our environment, we don't have a very large grain industry. So and like I know in Australia, in South America, and I presume in the US where there's large grain industries, you can get second quality grains that aren't quite large enough to go into some of the other industries. Um, we don't have that so much in New Zealand. So grain is a quite an expensive supplement. Um, and farmers, or how farmers do use it, um, because if it's very dry, some of the supplements we, we traditionally use in terms of growing crops aren't going to work as well. Um, so farmers might supplement up well, to two to three hundred grams per day of grains. Um, we do have some uh, grain-based pellets as well, but again, they're used infrequently. Okay. And we'll close with a couple of more questions on ewe lambs. Did you preg check ewe lambs after the rams are taken out? If so, when? What do you do with the ewe lambs that don't breed? It's, 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 it's a very good question, actually. Um, so, yes, we preg. Well, when I say we, um, the, the average industry practitioner, 85 to 90 percent, depending on the year, we've done some surveys, use pregnancy scanning. Um, at about 50 days after end of the breeding period. What we would do, though, and I should have said that in my slides, is we would advise you would use a mating harness on your rams during the breeding period because that's an early tool because if they don't have a mark on their rump, it's highly unlikely they haven't been mated. And that allows you then to split your ewe lambs into two mobs. Those that actually have an extra year, not, you know, oh, best part of an extra year to get to a suitable breeding weight versus those that need the extra food to get through pregnancy lactation. And so that's basically what our farmers do. They use harnesses on the rams, then they split them at the end of breeding because, you know, it's, it's expensive to put extra food into these young females. And you don't want to do that to a female that you're not going to get a return for over from a year, for another year away. So then, and, and so it's a tool of, of just targeting those, uh, that, put okay. the extra food in. So, that's a good question. I should have said that. Okay. And then last question is, there's a concern in the U.S. that overfeeding ewe lambs will cause fat deposits in the udder, compromising future udder structure and production. Is this a valid concern? So that's a very good question, actually, um, because that's been shown in a number of studies in cattle, uh, the so-called fatty udder syndrome, around growing very fast, at puberty is when they've kind of narrowed it down in cattle. Um, in their environment, where we can only get them to grow around the two to three hundred grams per day, versus say a slower growing one hundred grams per day, we don't see it. So under our farming conditions, we haven't seen it. In a scenario where you have a lot of supplementation, you might better get them around the four to five hundred grams per day. The answer is nobody knows. Um, but if you're in that two to three hundred grams per day, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure what that is in, in pounds, um, then there's no data to suggest that will occur. It's a myth. Okay. But it's often asked in New Zealand as well, so it's a fair question. Okay. 
Very good. Well, I know we're over time here, and I uh, there's a few questions we didn't get to here, and I apologize to our listeners for that, but we got tried to get to as many as we could and try to answer something from everybody. Um, I thank you for your for your time, Paul. A uh, great presentation. We don't often get to hear an expert like yourself on something like this from halfway around the world. <laughs> so uh, appreciate you doing this for us, and I thank our listeners. Uh, uh, for uh, attending tonight and just wanting to let everybody know that we will be, uh, this was recorded and we will be uh, sending out a uh, follow-up email to anybody who registered for the webinar and that'll have a link to the recording uh, that you can watch later or um, or share with somebody else that didn't get to see it. Uh, we'll also have a link in there that you can look at some of these slides a little, a little closer if you like. I, I did send out a uh, a message to all of our listeners doing the conversion from uh, kilograms to pounds, but uh, uh, it's not that difficult. <laughs> but but uh, uh, roughly 90 pounds for that uh, first break point, I think, when you're looking at breeding, and roughly 130 on the on the, when they're lambing. So uh, pretty good conversions on there, and uh, pretty easy to keep track of. So I really appreciate the information you gave everybody tonight here, uh, Paul, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. So. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. I hope, I hope it was of benefit. Oh, it sure was. So uh, anyway, everybody, good evening and, uh, and enjoy what's left of it out there. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, future webinars with you uh, sometime down the line here. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Jay.